Well, thank you very much. And uh, as with the other speakers, it's, uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to receive the, this award. Uh, I think Michael Green described the way we've set that up, that uh, the, the first two talks focused on what we're really trying to change, what determines functioning and the quality of life in people with schizophrenia. And then Bill Horan and I are going to talk about the vexing problem of treating these very interesting deficits. I'm going to give a perspective on uh, intervention research that's going to go back a few years. I figure as the senior member of the group, uh, I'm, I'm entitled to have a bit of a, a longer um, time frame to, to what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I, I want to talk about improving functioning, but I want to start by going back to uh, how I learned about the limitations of the medications that, that we have now for treating schizophrenia, about uh, how I learned that uh, drugs aren't the solution to this illness uh, in, in the great majority of people. I wonder if how we sort of took intervention research and began to move it towards improving functioning. And finally, uh, about a new area of, of, the, of pharmacology to facilitate training. In fact, uh, this recent area actually came about because of a uh, BBRF NARSAD Distinguished Investigator Award, which brought me into a new and, and very interesting area of intervention research. But to, to bring you back to some of the early studies that I was involved in, uh, this was a, a, a study which went uh, back, actually done during the 1980s, uh, where uh, a colleague and I, Ted, Ted Van Putten at, at UCLA, we uh, saw a, a group of patients. We did a very simple study. We randomized them to, uh, when they were newly admitted, to three different doses of haloperidol, uh, Haldol, uh, 5, 10, or 20 milligrams. At the time, most psychiatrists were treating patients with uh, 20 milligrams of, of haloperidol. And we wanted to see which drug, which dose was most effective. Uh, if you look at the top line, the blue line, that's the higher dose. And you could see this is, if you're looking at improvement in basic symptoms of schizophrenia, the higher dose actually seemed to be superior, meaning most clinicians were right in what they were prescribing. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the blue line, if you looked at what BPRS withdrawal retardation, being more withdrawn, talking less, uh, moving less, uh, actually that higher dose didn't look good. The other thing we found is that the patients on the higher dose, they were like escaping from the hospital. They were uh, signing out against medical advice. They were feeling absolutely miserable. So we found that the problem with antipsychotic drugs is that they can reduce psychosis, but they can make patients feel bad. Uh, and as a clinician, this, this was troubling. A lot of us hoped, as the new antipsychotics began to be introduced in the early 90s, that this would be changed. Uh, so we did a long-term study, a series of long-term studies that I did with NIMH support during the uh, 1980s and the 1990s and the early 2000s, where we looked at different drug strategies uh, to see which worked the best. And uh, we compared ris risperidone, a newer drug, and haloperidol for patients over a two-year period. And we found that um, they really weren't, if you looked at psychosis, they weren't very different. But the patients who got the risperidone, they felt subjectively better. They uh, seemed less anxious and depressed. And if you look at, uh, this is looking at a rating scale that the patients filled out. And going to the left is feeling better. And wherever you see the, uh, those dumbbells, that means that there was a, uh, a difference. And you could see that they were feeling less obsessive-compulsive, less depressed, less anxious, 
less hostile. In other words, the uh, antipsychotics -psycho are hard to prescribe because of their side effect profiles. We learned in the end that uh, they're important for treating symptoms, but the side effects can make people feel miserable. We also learned that antipsychotics treat psychosis, but they don't do very much else. Uh, and during the 1990s and late 1990s, uh, we began to hear from patients, their family members, advocates of patients, that uh, we needed to set our sights higher, that controlling symptoms was much too modest a goal for treating the illness, that uh, patients were interested in improving functioning and improving their quality of life, and uh, the tools that we were using were relatively ineffective, and I think that turned schizophrenia re intervention research, at least the research that we've done at UCLA, towards the direction of improving functioning. Uh, we learned a little bit more in a, uh, during the 1990s, I began to work with someone called uh, Robert Liberman, who was very interested in, in social skills training. He was so enthusiastic that it began to annoy me that, uh, so I, I tried to design the perfect study to prove that he was wasting his time. Uh, so it was a study where we compared his social skills training to um, a very sort of well-designed group psychotherapy with, um, done by an expert psychologist. And uh, I, I was proven wrong. Uh, that uh, we found that the social skills training really did affect the functioning of people in the community. That they were, uh, uh, the social skills improved, their family members noted it, and, and, and that it was a, uh, important. So that comes to, you know, the next lesson we learned that uh, they affect different outcomes, that the drugs treated psychosis, and the social skills training improved social adjustment. And, and this led me to this sort of interesting idea that drugs really aren't the treatment of schizophrenia, that they were a platform on which treatment could be built where treatment is aimed at improving functioning. Uh, and we found some, some very interesting interactions. This was a... Uh, uh, also a study with haloperidol uh, and risperidone and with different levels because we decided that if you're going to put people in a study for two years, it, you really have to give them some kind of uh, training, do something that's going to improve their functioning. Uh, and with this, this was enhanced skills training where we actually brought them out into the community. And what we found that was that the patients who were uh, uh, receiving risperidone uh, and the enhanced skills training were more, were more interested in, in staying with the study. They were, th this actually looks at whether or not the patients actually remained in, uh, in treatment. Uh, and it shows that giving them a drug, which didn't make them feel terrible, and uh, giving them uh, a more intensive kind of psychosocial treatment actually work together. Uh, which, you know, sort of changed our, our view. So in summary, we, uh, if we're going to improve functioning, we have to do more than just treat patients with drugs. And uh, that there were interesting interactions between drugs and psychosocial treatments. At the time, we had already learned that if patients are inadequately treated with drugs, they, um, they psychosocial treatments don't work. Um, this was found in, in earlier studies that we did looking with long-acting uh, antipsychotics that where you sort of guaranteed that patients were staying on their drugs, psychosocial treatments actually work better because patients were more stable. Uh, but that if drugs made people feel uncomfortable, that uh, they just didn't learn things. 
so this led us to uh, you know this this idea that we are, the research in the future in our laboratory we're going to combine drugs and psychosocial treatment and that that was the path to improving the illness. All of that said, we were still dissatisfied with the results. That uh, the um, changes in social functioning that we found were important for the people, but they were not nearly as substantial as the changes that we had hoped for. Uh, and, and this is the, the slide that uh, Michael showed you before, which uh, led us to actually focus much more on functioning. At about uh, the mid-90s, I began to work very closely with Michael Green, a collaboration which has uh, been you know, wonderful for me. And we sought to understand what the determinants of poor functioning are and how to treat them. And as you could see, uh, as Michael has demonstrated, Amanda emphasized cognition, treating the uh, social brain, and uh, also negative symptoms, motivation, the kind of apathy that's sometimes associated with schizophrenia was a major um, obstacle to actually uh, treating them. So we worked, uh, Michael and I worked uh, with NIMH on what was called the Matrix Initiative, which Amanda mentioned, which was to get the drug companies to begin to develop drugs that were specifically focused on improving cognition and later on in improving um, motivation. Uh, this, this led to enormous activity within the pharmaceutical industry. If you go to the place where clinical trials are demonstrated, clinicaltrials.gov, you will find a uh, literally, uh, last time I looked, it was about 30 different studies with different agents f using some of the instruments that uh, Michael and I developed, like the matrix battery and measure better measures for negative symptoms in order to improve functioning. Despite all that activity, we don't have, we've had a number of positive studies, but we don't have a drug yet. Some of them, uh, some of the drugs that sort of affect the glutamate system uh, seem to be effective in early studies. As later, later studies, it was less clear. Drugs that affect um, the uh, acetylcholine, particularly uh, nicotinic agonists, uh, showed some effects early on. We don't have a drug yet, but I think that we're sort of, I, I feel relatively optimistic that that's going to change. But what has happened during that, these years is that so, there's been a, um, just a, a, a renaissance in activity in psychosocial treatments. Uh, that uh, they, uh, these studies have uh, ad, ad, advanced rapidly and shown a, a, a lot of positive effects. Uh, Bill Horan is going to show you uh, in detail what, what, one of the treatments that um, uh, a psychosocial approach to social cognition which uh, seems very promising. With one of the vexing problems that uh, has happened is that if you take complex uh, social behaviors like the ability to uh, experience empathy, as Michael showed before, it's extraordinarily complex. I'm sorry. And, uh, and, and hard to uh, treat. Uh, the, the simple kind of training interventions that Bill Horan has worked at seem to be very good at affecting some of these kind of lower level social processes like being able to recognize emotions and faces. But in this sort of complex area of empathy, it, uh, it, it was harder to treat. Um, so we began to see whether or not 
we can uh, facilitate this training by using a drug. Uh, it's kind of the reverse of what we had done before, uh, we, we, which was sort of giving a psychosocial treatment to enhance drug effects. We want to see whether a drug could specifically make it easier for patients to, to learn. And the drug we focused on was uh, oxytocin. Uh, oxytocin is a uh, naturally occurring uh, peptide. It's, uh, it's, you know, administered to women as Pitocin to uh, help them, uh, you know, ex uh, deliver a pregnancy. Uh, to increase your uterine contractions, but it, it also uh, is very involved in the social brain. If uh, you give people oxytocin with a nasal spray, they seem more sensitive to social signals. Social signals take on more salience. That uh, the, are, uh, If you show them pictures, they, uh, they, they tend to gaze more at people's eyes when they have it, which is seen as pro-social behavior. Um, so we wanted to see whether we could administer oxytocin just before a session of social cognition training to see if it would improve learning. Um, so the, the research question was, by increasing the salience of social information, could oxytocin facilitate learning? And this was a, uh, a NARSAD BBRF uh, Distinguished Investigator Award, which really has, uh, I don't know if any, many, most of the awards that BBRF gives uh, really s launch the careers of uh, young investigators. The, uh, this Distinguished Investigator Award was able to take my research and really put it into a new direction of, of finding uh, drugs that could facilitate psychosocial treatments. To give you the feeling of how this study was done, we uh, took groups of people with schizophrenia, uh, six or eight people, and um, if you could imagine, uh, we, 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 evaluate, oops, we, we, we evaluated their uh, social cognition, we randomized them to receiving a placebo or oxytocin, which is taken as a, actually a nasal spray, so if you can imagine the way this study is conducted, imagine a, uh, uh, there's a, a, an ante room to a group room. Uh, a, a research assistant goes around, and every, all of the people, before they go into group, have to take a certain number of sprays uh, in each nostril. Some of them are oxytocin. Some of them are placebo. They then go in, and, and they get the group training. Uh, we measure whether or not they've learned uh, a week later. So we're not looking at whether or not the drug is actually changing their social cognition. We're looking at whether or not uh, they actually learned something new. And so what we found was in looking at uh, empathy, and this was a measure of empathic accuracy, where they actually watch people talking about their emotions and kind of identify those emotions, uh, being able to put themselves in other people's shoes. And what we found was that the people who received the oxytocin uh, actually learned faster. This was apparent at a week after the uh, la last group, and then it was uh, also apparent a month later. So whatever they had learned, they uh, were, were able to, to sustain that learning. So in conclusion, you know, you know, what we've learned over the years is that uh, antipsychotics can improve psychosis, but they, uh, it's sort of a double-edged sword and they can make people feel miserable. Uh, they also don't improve functioning, and we need to sort of move on to things that can improve functioning. Uh, targeted psych, at this point in time, we don't have a drug which can uh, reliably improve cognition, although I'm optimistic that we will in the next a few years. There's enormous work going on in the industry. 
but we do have targeted psychosocial treatments that do improve functioning. And then in the future, I think we can look to a day when uh, we can actually prescribe medications that will facilitate psychosocial treatments. This is only a portion of what, of, of what we're doing in intervention research. I mean, we look forward to a day when we could look at uh, biological information, we can look at uh, genetic information, and then design personalized treatments. But I think that given all of the tools that we have right now, the, it's very promising that we can actually develop treatments that will have long-term and very positive effects on the outcome of schizophrenia. Thanks so much for your attention. Questions for Dr. Martyr? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, he's coming. Hi, thank you for sharing with us first off, but I was wondering if you might draw a greater distinction between the social skills training versus the group psychotherapy. And as a uh, subpart to my question, um, it sounds like the levels of the participants uh, had higher levels of negative symptoms. They weren't, in other words, the higher functioning individuals that uh, sometimes mm -hmm. are uh, suffering from you know, different uh, disorders like uh, schizophrenia? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. You know, the group of people who were in the, that early study were uh, people who had been, most of them had uh, 10 to 20 years of illness, and they had very impaired social functioning. So uh, I think that, and, and, and I think the difference between the group therapy and the, um, and the skills training was that it specifically focused on areas in which they had deficits, and it, they provided training, it provided things like behavioral rehearsal, homework assignments, encouraging people to go out into the community and, and to use these kinds of social skills. So I, I think it was well adapted to that population. It might not work for young people with schizophrenia who are college students and have different kinds of problems. I, I think the thing about psychosocial treatment, it's not, uh, it's probably something that, you, that, that needs to be individualized for uh, an individual's needs. The people that we had did have substantial amount of negative symptoms. Apathy, uh, which made, and, and, and that was very hard to deal with in many of these studies. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, I have a daughter who has had schizophrenia her whole life. I've seen her on every antipsychotic. Mm -hmm. And about several years ago, I noticed a real improvement in her. And then I discovered that she had been using an illegal drug called ketamine. Ketamine. And, uh, and since then, everything is improved. And I mean everything is improved. Uh, and I noticed that uh, I saw an ad for Mount Sinai developing this drug uh, in a nasal form. Do you know anything about it? Can you say something about it? Well, yeah. I Ketamine is a, a, it's a very you know, interesting drug. It's, it's, it's used on the street. It, uh, actually, if you give ketamine to people with schizophrenia, it usually worsens their symptoms. As a matter of fact, if you give ketamine to uh, people, uh, you know, just uh, because it's also used as a treatment for depression, but they, but they have a transient worsening in their, in their psychosis. So how your, uh, how your daughter improved after ketamine, I, I can't explain it. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's just an interesting observation. Uh, ketamine is uh, now used as a uh, treatment for rapid intervention for, for severe depression, uh, usually 
around cities, there, there are places where you can get ketamine infusions, and the drug companies are trying to develop it for the, the, the rapid treatment of, of severe depressions. Um, you had a chart that indicated that drugs plus some training uh, was the most effective treatment among mm -hmm. the four. But the training um, showed either standard training, standard skills training, or enhanced right. skills training. Could you speak to the difference between the two? Sure. Fact, fact, that's, a, that's a very good question. The, one of the problems with uh, skills training, and, and a lot of these kind of training interventions, is that you can improve patients' uh, skills in the training setting, but then when they go out into the community, they don't actually generalize to the community. So what we did for the enhanced skills training is we actually, as they learned something, uh, in skills training, we would actually go out with a trainer into the community and they would rehearse those skills. It could be at a, a coffee shop or something like that. So we sort of tried to promote generalizing the skills learned in the lab to actually in the community. And, and, and in fact, we're actually doing that now with some of our social cognition skills training. Uh, uh, Michael Green has a, uh, a study which actually is, use, is taking some of the things that we've developed in the laboratory and uh, looking at how we can help patients use those skills actually in, the, in, uh, in, in their communities. Uh, 